Sometimes the Lord will make you wait. So wait a minute. Let me get this straight. Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. So he stayed in the place where he was two more days? Now, hold on. Y'all got to help me with this. He loved them, so he decided to delay on them. Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. So he stayed in the place where he was in a dire situation two days longer. How can he say that he loved them and delay on them? How can he say that he loves me, me be in a dire situation, but he say, wait. How can he say that he loves you and then delay on you? This is Martha and Mary we're talking about. In Luke chapter 10, 38 through 42, it's the Martha that was cooking in the kitchen for Jesus. And yes, she was a little overzealous, but she was just trying to serve Jesus. It was Mary who sat at his feet soaking in his word relating to her Savior. This was the Mary that had the alabaster veil of perfume that anointed Jesus. She gave Jesus all of her value. In that moment, she was serving Jesus. Even the disciples thought she was giving him too much. They loved Jesus, and Jesus loved them. And his response was to make them wait. Jesus, our brother, is sick to the point of death. That means it's urgent. Don't be late. Don't be late. We got a situation right now. Don't be late. We need you. And if you think about it, what makes matters worse is in John eleven four, 4, Jesus makes a promise. This sickness will not end in death. It won't end in death. But so that the glory, so that God can be glorified and the Son of God can be glorified by it. This is not going to end in death. But if it's not going to end in death, then why were Mary and Martha watching their brother die? See, the thing for me is when I read this, this sounds so eerily familiar to me. Because that's what we were doing. We were praying. My dad was cooking up sermons. We were serving with everything we had, giving him as much as our value as we could give him. And I'm not saying that makes us entitled to anything. I'm just saying we love him. And we know that he loves us. Our mother is sick to the point of death. Don't be late. Come now. We're praying to you because we believe that you're a miracle worker, a way maker, a promise keeper, a light in the darkness. Come through. She's getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Why are you making me wait? Don't do me like you did Martha and Mary. I read their story. Don't make me wait like that. And we prayed the promises of God. 1 John 5, 14, we can be confident if you come to him according to his will, he hears you. We prayed Matthew 21, 22 that says, ask believing and you shall receive it. We didn't mind waiting a little while because if you wait, he will renew your strength. You'll mount up with wings like eagles. You will run and not grow weary. We were okay. We knew that if it's not good yet, God's not done yet. We understood that all things work out for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. We understood that if God is for you, then who can be against you? 
We understood that he's going to finish the work that he started. We understood the promises of God in Scripture, and we prayed those things, and he was making me wait. She's sick to the point of death, Lord. Come now. And then she died. And some of you, if the truth are told, you're thinking the same thing. Your child is going left. If they go any more left, they're going to fall off a cliff. Come now, Jesus. My marriage is on the last straw. We're trying to get this right. Help us. My life is breaking all around me from financial to mental to emotional, depression, anxiety. I need you. Come through. I believe. I'm praying for someone right now who's sick and ill to the point of death. Jesus, come on. And so you're on the precipice just like Mary and Martha, and you're wondering, where is Jesus? And to make matters worse, he waited on purpose. And you're saying, Jesus, don't be late. I need you now. Meanwhile, Jesus is saying, I love you, but right now I'm just not showing up for you. I'm just saying, sometimes, y'all, our faith can be frustrating. Because by the time Jesus gets there, the thing that you're praying about is already dead. It's too late. And so I know that many of you can understand the sentiment of Martha. When Jesus is late, Lazarus has already died. And Martha comes up to Jesus and says, Lord, Lord. If only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, he will do. Martha, your brother will rise again. Yes, I know. He will rise again. And the resurrection at the last day. Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. He who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes. Yes. I have always, I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. The one who was sent from this world, from God. And many of you are feeling her frustration. And that discourse with Jesus, you're thinking the same thing. If you would have been here, the marriage that was on the last straw now wouldn't be in divorce proceedings. If you would have been here and you would have come through, the child that was going left wouldn't have gone all the way. If you wouldn't have been here, the life that was breaking now wouldn't be broken. If you would have been here, the person that I was praying for who was sick wouldn't have succumbed to their illness. Lord, if you would have been here and you need to hear today what Jesus told Martha back then. He said, I am the resurrection. Martha, you're looking at the grave. Look at me. I am the victory. The scripture is fulfilled right in front of you. You're looking at the wrong thing. I am the life and I'm standing right in front of you. I've already accomplished it. It's already won. It's already done. Look at me, Marthas. I know your child has already gone left, but look at me. I am the redeemer. I know your life is broken, but I am the potter. 
I know you may have lost your home and in your finances, but I am your covering. And I know the person you are praying for has already died, but look at me. I am the life. You're looking at the wrong thing. He used the term I am. I am. You can find it all the way back in Exodus 3. Exodus 3, when Moses said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And God said, I am who I am. You're saying, am I? You need to put the personal pronoun in the right position and change it to I am. Stop thinking about you. Stop thinking about the problem. Look at me. He said, you go tell the people of Israel that I am sent you. I know they're in bondage, but I am their freedom. And Moses, I know you're afraid, but I am your victory. Look at me, Moses. And there are people in this audience right now that you're looking at death, you're looking at the tomb, and Jesus is saying, look at me. You're not seeing this clearly because Martha Martha knew the Bible. You see, when Jesus said in that discourse that you just watched, he said, your brother will rise again. You know what Martha said? I know he's going to rise on the last day. She was quoting scripture. She understood Isaiah 26, 19. She understood Daniel 12, 2. It's reiterated in John chapter 5, 28 and 29 that those who are dead will be resurrected in that hour and on that day. So she understood the scripture. But what Jesus was saying is the scripture is fulfilled right in front of your face. You know the doctrine and you know the scripture, but don't miss the person of the doctrine and the scripture. I'm right in front of you. I'm right here, Martha. I've already done it. I'm here. You're staring at a tomb. Look at me. I'm here. God in the flesh who has the power to turn your situation around. Why was he telling Martha to look at him? Why was he telling Martha, I am? Why was he switching her framework, not just to the scriptures about him, but to the him that the scriptures are about? You need to understand this just like Martha needed to understand it back then. You can know doctrine and still be dead. You can be in the church, but the church not be in you. You can know the Bible, but miss the person of the Bible. I know people who have graduated from seminary that are further from Jesus than they've ever been in their life. They know the Bible, but they miss the person. If you are sick, you're not looking for a medical book. You're looking for a doctor. When you are sued, you're not just looking for a law book, you're looking for a lawyer. You need the person of the book to vie on your behalf. And when you're facing your biggest problem, your biggest struggle, when you're facing sin and death itself, you don't just need a book about Jesus, you need Jesus. I need you to look at me. I'm right here in front of you. I was seeing this wrong. When it came to my mom, I saw it wrong. She died and I was frustrated like Martha. If you would have been here. My mother died and then the spirit of God said, fiction, she lives. Look at me. Stop looking at that and look at me. In me is your victory. In me is your life. In a twinkling of an eye, she was ushered into the presence of God because I already redeemed and delivered. I already gave her victory. Look at me, Jonathan. You're looking at the wrong thing. So just because he's not on your time, doesn't mean he's not right on time. How can he ever be late when in his life he accomplished victory forever, always, now? He's already done it. He's already won. And you experience that frustration that Martha ran out here with, and Jesus is saying to you, I am looking. 
Get your perspective right on what I've already accomplished. And while you're talking about me being late, I've already come and I've already won. And then he finished the discourse with Martha with this question that you need to be asked. He said, Martha, I am. And then he looked at her as I looked at, look at you now and he said, do you believe this? I've explained it to you, but the question is not, do you have the word? The question is, do you believe the word that came to you? Do you believe this? Do you actually believe this? You're going to need to believe this. Because when it seems like Jesus is late and your situation has already flatlined and you're staring at a tomb, Things just seem to get harder. Lord, Lord, if, if only you would have been there, my brother would not have died. He would not have died. I said to myself, I'm gonna wait on you. I'm gonna wait on you. I tasted your goodness. I trusted your promise. I need to wait on you. I need to wait on you. I tasted your goodness. Trusted your promise. Mary, where have they laid him? They laid him right there, my Lord. You need to understand this moment. In the discourse that Jesus had with Mary, the shortest verse in the Bible appears. John eleven thirty five 35 says, Jesus wept. This is God who has become flesh to let you know that he feels what you feel. To let you know that he is at the tomb with you. To let you know that he experienced your sorrow, that you are not alone. You had a coach that played the game. <laughs> Hebrews 4 says, we serve a great high priest who can sympathize with your weaknesses. He's right there with you at the tomb and he shed tears with Mary. He's compassionate towards your struggle. He's compassionate to what you've lost. He's compassionate to what you're going through, the things that you are feeling, the anxiety that you're experiencing, the grave that you're at. He is crying the tears with you because the Jesus we serve is a good God. The Jesus we serve is a compassionate God. So for the person that's in this room that's lost someone or something and you're sitting in a dark room by yourself, that's the enemy, you're not by yourself. Jesus Christ has his arms around you. He's cried the tears that you're crying. And he sympathizes with what you're going through. Because the God we serve, y'all, is a good God. And he has his arms around you. As he weeps with Mary, God become flesh all the way down to share in your experience. But you need to understand that God is what you need. Because when Martha came to Jesus, she said, Lord, if you would have been here. When Mary came to Jesus, she said, Lord, if you would have been here, 
They both said the same thing and Jesus gave them different responses but based on what they needed. To Martha, he gave theology and doctrine of the victory of the person of Jesus Christ. To Mary, he gave tears. He spoke to Martha's head and spirit and he spoke to Mary's heart. Because no matter who you are, if you but dare to go to God's word, you're going to realize that the scriptures can theologize with you. They can emote with you. They can comfort you. They can feel you. They can challenge you. They can discipline you. They can sympathize with you. They can empathize with you. And they have the power to resurrect you. The scriptures are sufficient for your pain. They're sufficient for your loneliness. They're sufficient for your salvation. They're sufficient for your burdens. They are sufficient for your tears. But you must come to the word. And when you come to the word, you come like Mary and Martha with an unveiled face. And the Bible will speak to you and be there right with you in your trauma and your turmoil. That's why the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 7, cast your cares on the Lord for he cares for you. Isaiah 41, 10 says, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. I am your God and I will uphold you with my mighty right hand. But you have to come to the word. In this discourse, the word gave Mary tears, letting you know that God himself shares in your tears and your sorrow and your experiences. He's at the tomb with you. But you also need to know that wasn't the only reason for those tears. Jesus was weeping with Mary, but he was weeping about something else. See, Jesus already knew he was going to raise Lazarus. John 11, 4 says this sickness is not going to end in death. He already knew what he was going to do. He already planned that there was going to be a resurrection in this circumstances. He knew that he was going to turn her sorrow into joy. So if he knew that he was going to change the situation, why was he weeping? Because the tomb and the sorrow of Mary represented all those who would not have the resurrection. He was crying about those who would die and stay dead. He knew he was going to raise, but there are those who will be raised, Daniel 12, 2, to everlasting contempt. They won't have the resurrection. They won't have Jesus. And he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. So he's crying the tears for the people who would reject him, for the people who would doubt him, for the people who would walk away from him, for the people who would not believe in him, because that tomb would be their tomb for eternity. What he was about to do for Lazarus, foreshadowing what he would do himself, some would not get. And that is real sorrow. So my hope today is that the tears he was crying back then weren't for you. That the tears he was crying with Martha and Mary, thinking about this tomb and those who would not be raised to everlasting life, weren't for the people in this church and the people that are online. That you come to Christ and realize he is the resurrection for my spirit, my soul, and my situation. And he was at the tomb. Mary. In John eleven thirty eight, 38, he sees the tomb and says, there's one problem. There's a stone laying against it. And if that stone stays there, you go miss this miracle. That stone was the obstacle that was in the way from the power of the Messiah and the miracle that he would do. 
As long as that stone is there, Lazarus stays dead. As long as that stone is not rolled away, there is no miracle, there is no resurrection. A lot of us think we're waiting on God and God is saying, oh no, I'm waiting on you. I'm ready to do a miracle, but I'm not going to do a miracle if you don't move that stone. Mary, where's Martha? I need her both back out here because I need to tell you today what Jesus told them back then. You see, there has to be a move of faith so God will go back to the person in sorrow. He will go back to the person hurting and he's going to find out, do you trust me? He's going to find out, do you actually have faith in me? He's going to find out, are you a church goer or are you actually ready to go? He's going to find out what you're willing to do to experience this miracle because Jesus responds to obedience. So he told them back then, and he's telling you now, Mary, Martha, move the stone. Lord, he has been dead for four days. The stone. The stone. Wrong answer. And that's what many of you are doing. Lord, I can't do that. The situation been dead too long. Lord, I can't do that. This don't make no sense. Lord, I can't do that because if I do that, this will mess up. Lord, I can't do that. The marriage been over. Lord, I can't do that. This thing is already dead. He doesn't want to hear your logic. He wants you to move the stone. He doesn't want to hear you give him a lesson on mortuary science. That's not what he asked you for. He is there and he is your resurrection. That's what we do with him. We got stuff that's dead. We've been crying out to him. He's ready to give you an answer. He calls you to do something. And you start talking about why you can't do it. Meanwhile, he's, a, he's by the Father. He's saying he's, t he's, do, he's dancing. He's ready to do a miracle. But he's waiting on you because he's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond. All that you can ask or think according to the power that works in you. You will not see what he does in the invisible until he sees what you do in the visible. Because without faith, it is impossible to please the Lord. So I'm going to give you one more chance. I'm going to give you one more opportunity. Martha, Mary, remove the stone. I know that thing is brittle. I know that stone is heavy. I know that stone is, is calloused. I know that stone is a burden. But until you move that stone, you will not see the glory of God. Until that stone rolls away, you'll be in the same position today you were in yesterday. So when you move the stone, these things can change. When you move the stone, you can experience the glory of God. The glory of God is waiting on you. It's waiting on you to move this stone. It's waiting on you to press and not be satisfied with where you are. It's waiting on you to make a move. Because when you move, he'll move. When you move, he'll move. When you change, he'll change. He's waiting by his father. And he's ready for you to move that stone. I need you to understand something. In verse 41 and 42, after the stone is moved, Jesus prays. He says, Father, thank you for always hearing me. Thank you for always being there. I knew you would do it before we did it. I want to thank you. What did he do? Jesus is your advocate. He is your intercessor. So as soon as Martha and Mary obeyed, he tapped God the Father and said, now it's our time. He tapped God the Father and said, now it's our moment. Now that they obeyed, we can do what we do. And then he said three words. In verse 43, he said three words. He prayed after they moved the stone. And then he said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. Don't stay where you are, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. There's some people in here, you have some stones that need to be moved. There's some
some people in here who have the stone of doubt that needs to be moved. You have the stone of unbelief that needs to be moved. You have the stone of your pride. It needs to be moved. You have the stone of your self-sufficiency. It needs to be moved. And Jesus is talking to you. If you have something dead in your tomb that needs to be raised, he's saying, Lazarus, come forth. Yes. This is your moment. This is your time. But the story didn't even end there. In verse 44, he said, unbind him and let him go. There are some people in here, you need to be unbound. You need to be set free. Jesus is speaking from the heavens. Unbind him and let him go. Unbind her and let her go. Unbind the child and let the child go. Unbind the situation, let the situation go. Unbind that marriage and let it go. Unbind that mind and let it go. Unbind those emotions and let them go. Unbind that depression, let it go. Unbind that anxiety, let it go. Unbind those problems, let it go. Unbind that situation, let it go. Lazarus, come forth. This is your moment. It's time for a miracle. We've been talking about it all month. This is your moment if you need a miracle and you want to be unbound. Remove the stone. Lazarus, come forth. The altar is open. Come forth. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ, come forth. If your marriage is struggling, come forth. If you've got problems that have died, come forth. If you've got someone that's sick, come forth. If you need Jesus, come forth. This is time for a miracle. Let's go.
message, your message, the message from your word, from your life. And we pray, Lord, that they will experience a miracle. That right now, as their advocate and their intercessor, you will intercede. You will tap God the Father, and you will say, God, it's our moment. The stone has been removed. There are lives that need to be resurrected. There's brokenness that needs to be put back together. There are people's minds who need to be stabilized. There's emotions that need to be strengthened. We need your healing. And we pray, Lord, right now that they will come back next week and have testimony that bodies have been healed, that situations have been raised, that marriages have been saved, that children are coming home. We will have the testimony from the Lord from what we've experienced right now. Now, for those who have not accepted Jesus Christ and you're at the altar right now and you don't know that you've ever given Jesus your life, I'm going to say a prayer, and as a prayer of faith, we're going to say it all together. It's not the prayer that saves you. It is your belief in a faithful God that saves you. I'm just going to use it to lead you. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I'm in need of a Savior. I pray that you would be my Savior right now. I believe that you lived a perfect life. I believe that you died a sinner's death. And I believe that you raised from the grave. For me, save me, Jesus. From my hands to my feet, my today and tomorrow, I'm looking only to you. Through faith, by grace, in Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Celebrate him in the room. Just to let you know that this is where it starts, this is not where it ends. We are a church that's going to keep walking and keep growing and keep going. Because for believers, it never ends. For believers, we don't even get to die because of the victory we have in Jesus Christ. And so we're going to walk this thing out. We're going to talk this thing out. But you need to expect a miracle because the stone has been moved away. If you are one in here who has a really desperate need, then we have a, a few. We have some people over here that will pray for you. You have a desperate need. We want to pray for you and sit with you, those that really need one-on-one. -on -one. If you need one-on-one, -on -one, we want to take it to the next level for you because we want to connect with you and want you to know that this is not just an emotional moment. When the emotions are gone, we'll still be here and so will Jesus crying at that tomb. When the emotions are gone, you still got to walk this thing out and that stone is heavy. And so we want you to know that we're with you. Chris Wheel is over here with his hand raised. If you have a specific need, I want you to go right now. You just have a specific need right now. Just go that you want to pray for. If not, you can return to your seats. If you have a specific need, just go this way. You want to be healed. You, you need a miracle in a specific way. Let's celebrate him as they move. Let's celebrate them, celebrate him. Because of the amazing work that Jesus Christ is going to do. We had an awesome August experiencing the miracles of Jesus Christ. I want you to go forth from here today believing in the miracle walking in the miracle and even in death because we're believers we still have a miracle called eternal life you only walk like a loser if you think you're lost but if you know you're one you just need to change what you're looking at Jesus says look at me I am your victory what we're gonna do before I give the benediction as a pastor Gibson said 
We're returning next week. I know y'all excited to drop your kids off. And we're excited to receive them. And so we're great. We're excited about that, having that opportunity. After church, um, there's Rita's Italian Ice because we want you to go out there and get hot and cool off. And so we want you to fellowship with one another, stick around, and enjoy the time that we've had. Celebrate him if you enjoyed August. Not for me or the singers, but Jesus and what he's doing in our lives. Still yet work to do. So I'm going to ask everyone to stand. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. up here yelling. Y'all stand. And I'm going to have my sister Priscilla give the benediction as we get ready to go home. And you know what? I am going to give the benediction, but I, I am going to say. I am going to say that you have blessed Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship this month, Jonathan. The Spirit of God is on you to preach His Word with power and authority. So we thank you for what you gave us this month. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you for everything you have done, everything you have accomplished in our lives, the word that you have given us, how you have introduced yourself to us afresh and anew this month. We thank you, Father. And now we pray, Lord, that as we go forth from this place, we'll be, we will be carriers of the Holy Spirit of God, that everything we do will drip with anointing, Father. Every word that we say, every encouragement that we give, every decision that we make, every attitude that we have, Lord, may your name be glorified through our lives. It is not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God. So let your Spirit fall afresh upon every man, every woman, every son, every daughter, so that we can reflect your, gl your glory. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody agreed and said amen.